If you work in the field of data and analytics, you've probably seen a lot of discussion on social media, blogs, and LinkedIn about Microsoft Fabric. The slide that you're looking at right now is very busy, but it's my attempt to explain the different components of what we now call Microsoft Fabric and where it all came from. Throughout the course of this presentation, I'll walk through each of these different lineages and describe how and why it all came together. I should note that I put this presentation together on my own using internet searches, talking to friends, talking to colleagues, and none of the content is officially endorsed by my employer. Also, some of the dates and products might even be wrong. I did the best I could with the information that I had at hand. So I'll just start off with a little bit of background about myself and why I came to do this presentation and the style that it was done. I'm currently working as a data and AI technical specialist for healthcare at Microsoft. I've been at Microsoft over seven years, going on eight. I've been in Microsoft's healthcare operating unit since it was formed back in 2017. And my day job is mostly doing things like POCs, pilots, demos, architectural design sessions, and answering questions for customers about Microsoft's data and AI products. And I decided to dedicate my career towards data and analytics when I was using ProClarity with SQL Server 2005 a number of years back. For those of you who don't know, which I will discuss in the presentation, ProClarity was one of Microsoft's early ventures into business intelligence. So first of all, a couple of key points about this presentation. I want to stress that from my perspective, you need to understand the past in order to understand the present and future. So when we talk about Microsoft Fabric, understanding what it is, where it came from, and why things happened the way they did is uh, important background information. Also, I want to stress that not all of the dates and components of this presentation will be accurate or complete. I did the best I could based on my memory, friends I talk to, colleagues I work with, internet searches, but I'm sure there's going to be gaps and inaccuracies, so this should not be taken as a statement of historical record. And again, it has not been approved by my employer. It's just me doing the best job I could with the tools I had available. Finally, I tried to make this presentation entertaining and interesting so that you can have fun while learning about the history of fabric. My undergraduate degree was in biology, and I personally have a passion for the sciences, so I thought it would be fun to look at the evolution of this product from a perspective that used an analogy to biological evolution. I know it's a little bit ridiculous, and it's not necessarily a, uh, a valid comparison from a scientific perspective, but I think it makes it fun and uh, hopefully it keeps you engaged and gives you a few laughs. So starting off, what is this mysterious new tool called Microsoft Fabric? And you'll note here that the image on this slide, I believe it was actually generated with the original version of Doll E in OpenAI. I'm willing to bet that if I redid this image today using Doll E3, I'd get much better results. So when you first hear about Microsoft Fabric, you might be thinking, is this something that was you know, molded from code by Microsoft engineers in a single development sprint of genius? Is it all new and completely different software than has ever existed before? Is it something that just happened after trial and error? Or is this something that has been evolving over time, and by time I mean decades, guided by several different product trials and some failures of historical software products? So why did I choose this topic for the presentation? First of all, it comes up a lot when I talk to customers Fabric, what is that? Is that the same thing as Azure Fabric? What does it mean? What's in it? And for starters, it's very different from Azure Fabric. It's its own unique product. And if we think along the terms of our scientific analogy to biology and evolution, in evolution, you had a period of time that was called the boring billion. And it was effectively a part of Earth's history where for a billion years, nothing significant happened, at least not in the fossil record. And there appears to be this long period of, you know, stability where, you know, evolution and uh, speciation is, is not necessarily happening in a rapid pace. There was also a period called Snowball Earth, where the Earth actually froze over completely so that everything was effectively under ice. And leading up to our time, there was rapid evolution of species and plants and animals and all those different things, as illustrated by the Doll E image for which the prompt was create an image of diverse life on Earth, including dinosaurs and people. So how does this relate to Microsoft Fabric? Well, we had the SQL Server days, and this may sound like a travesty to people who are, you know, DBAs who work in the SQL world, 
But to a lot of people, that was just a boring time where performance gains and security features were the primary advancements that you'd see every couple of years. Next, within the world of data and analytics, there was a period of trial and error where different, where different products from different parts of Microsoft and acquisitions were integrated together. I found this Microsoft slide in some archives, and some people refer to it as the cheeseburger diagram. We'll dig into that a little bit later. And finally, today we have Fabric, where we are seeing rapid evolution of data and analytics products that will provide value for many different personas of users. Now, again, I want to stress that I'm not trying to make a direct analogy between biological evolution and the evolution of technology. I just thought it would be a fun way to view how this product has come along. But I wanted to do a comparison and show that on the left, if we look at biological evolution, you usually have diversion of species. So if we're looking at, uh, for example, the ancestors of what came to be, you know, foxes and wolves and coyotes and dogs, things diverge, but they do not converge. Uh, so you'll occasionally get interbreeding such as a, uh, a koi wolf, uh, but you're not going to see a koi bear. Uh, usually when things get uh, genetically far apart enough, they, uh, they can no longer intermix and uh, you'll have diversion, but not conversion. Now you can have convergent species where a uh, dolphin or a porpoise might evolve to look more like a fish, but it doesn't actually revert to where it can interbreed with a fish. Now within the world of technology, you can have divergence where, for example, a technology such as Power Query uh, led to uh, components of SQL Server Analysis Services to data sets or what they now call a semantic model in Power BI. Uh, at one point, it... Uh, Originally, I believe, was a plugin for Excel, and it's still there, and it's a very useful tool. Uh, and then it was also brought into uh, Azure Data Factory at one point. But now, the different versions of Power Query are reconverging back into Fabric. So from that perspective, very different type of evolution, but you can actually have convergent evolution where tools come back together in the technology world. So moving back to that original diagram that we looked at in the opening of this video, let's start with SQL Server. So if we go back to the 1990s, you had uh, SQL Server uh, around the time of SQL Server 7.0, Microsoft acquired a company called Panorama. What Panorama brought to the table was a technology that would allow you to build what we now call cubes or multidimensional cubes. So for SQL Server 7.0, I believe there was a plugin called OLAP Tools. But then for SQL Server 2000, it was officially a part of the product. And I can remember seeing some early OLAP cubes from SQL Server 2000. At the time, you could only have one fact table in a cube. There were some limitations, but it gave you the ability to have multidimensional reporting with good query performance. For SQL Server 2005, SQL reporting services was added to the mix. And some of the documentation I found noted that uh, reporting services was available with SQL Server 2000, but it really took off with SQL Server 2005. And reporting services, uh, affectionately known as SSRS, originally worked really well with SQL Server, but probably because Panorama was an external acquisition, uh, initially it didn't work as well with uh, Cubes or uh, OLAP tools. Uh, eventually, that would change, and you can now connect to OLAP tools uh, from SQL reporting services. Uh, but back in the day, I remember it, uh, it, it really worked well with SQL Server. And SQL Report Builder uh, was also uh, a version of SQL reporting services uh, for building the reports using that technology. Then from SQL Server 2008, we saw SQL Server 2008 R2. And I wasn't able to find an exact date, but sometime after 2010, uh, SQL Server 2008 R2 kind of spawned off the original version of Azure SQL Database. You'll notice that that's blue because it comes from Azure. Everything that's SQL is in black and acquisitions and uh, new partnerships are purple. Then with SQL Server 2012, a new type of reporting database was introduced called tabular models. I'll talk a little bit more about where those came from uh, with some of the additional components of this slide. Effectively, tabular models became the next generation version of cubes or OLAP tools. However, it's a completely different technology that serves the same purpose. Shortly after SQL Server 2012, again, I wasn't able to find specifics. The APS was launched, which was a parallel data warehouse. 
And it was actually an appliance that you could buy, like a SQL server. And then that eventually gave rise to Azure SQL Data Warehouse, which was and is a parallel data warehouse in the cloud. So just to summarize, SQL Server was introduced in the late 90s as a relational database tool. Then the Panorama purchase brought OLAP cubes to the mix. SSRS came in the mid 2000s. Towards the end of the 2000s, SSAS and cubes exploded in popularity and a lot of different companies were looking for people who had cube and MDX expertise. Sometime around 2011, a version of SQL for the Azure cloud was introduced. SQL Server 2012 introduced tabular models, which would eventually replace OLAP cubes, even though OLAP cubes are still available in SQL Server today. And then this, this eventually spawned off the uh, Parallel Data Warehouse, uh, otherwise known as the APS or PDW, which then became Azure SQL Data Warehouse. So just for fun, let's take a look at a few slides that I was able to either find in the archives or which were passed along to me from some of my colleagues. Here's a slide from SQL Server 2005. You can see it's around the time that they introduced gradient backgrounds for PowerPoint. So we have this super cool metallic sheen behind the, uh, the objects on the screen. And SQL Server 2005 was touted as a comprehensive and integrated data platform. At the bottom, you had your SQL Server engine. Then you had your ETL layer, which would eventually become SSIS or SQL Server Integration Services. You had replication services for data replication, notification services so that you could get alerting about things going on with your data or perhaps your appliance. I honestly don't recall exactly what that did. Then analysis services, which were those SQL OLAP cubes or OLAP tools, and then reporting services in order to deliver reports to end users. Some of the talking points were the ability to integrate your relational databases with OLAP views, having the best of both MOLAP and ROLAP, which is either the ability to have a cube of cached data uh, or to actually use the cube as a metadata layer that passes queries back to SQL Server, and then some advanced business intelligence capabilities, so KPIs, MDX scripts, those sorts of things. And reporting services was introduced with SQL Server 2000, but really became bigger as the decade went on. It allowed you to create very detailed and customizable reports, but it did take a lot of time to build those reports. And from my perspective, you still had to have somebody who was highly technical to build the reports uh, using SQL Server reporting services. There was also the BI Development Studio. As you can see, we have a relational star schema design here on the slide. And at the time it was touted for being extremely easy to use. Now at the time it did seem easy versus something that had to be custom coded from scratch. But by today's standards, there was still quite a hill to climb before you could be proficient with this tool and build solutions that were gonna be highly performant. So let's move back to our slide. Let's take a look at the modern work lineage. So even before the timeline starts, Excel was launched somewhere around 1985. ProClarity was formed sometime in the 90s and it became an acquisition by Microsoft and was extremely valuable because it was designed to work really well with uh, OLAP cubes. Next, SharePoint was launched somewhere in the neighborhood of the year 2000. I wasn't able to pin down an exact year. Then with SharePoint 2007, you saw some integration between ProClarity and SharePoint. So a new tool was created called Performance Point that integrated parts of ProClarity, and I stress parts, not all, and along with performance point planning, which not many people probably remember and died an early death, was introduced to SharePoint 2007 as an attempt to bring data and analytics and business intelligence uh, into the SharePoint suite. Moving forward, Excel continued to mature and effectively be the number one data tool in the world. Uh, SharePoint came out with a new version every couple of years, and then in 2010, Excel came out with two new tools, Power Pivot and Power Query. Power Pivot was a new way to build databases that are intended for reporting. It was a new type of columnar database. And Power Query was a new ETL tool that was intended to be easy to use and drag and drop for the typical Excel user. Now, in 2013, Excel added Power View and Power Maps 
Power View was Silverlight based, and it was an attempt to build a very easy to use drag and drop reporting tool that didn't require the level of expertise that somebody would need to build something like SQL Server reporting services. Uh, also moving back to Performance Point, uh, Performance Point was you know, at the time, a, a very performant tool, but you also had to be very technical uh, and detail oriented in order to build good reports. So PowerView was more drag and drop, looked and felt more like something that you'd experience today, but it was Silverlight based. And then Power Maps was actually separate from PowerView and gave you things like, uh, you know, 3D motion maps and things like that, that were, uh, you know, very interesting and demoed very well. Now, that Power Pivot database eventually was migrated into SQL Server 2012 and became what we now know as a tabular model. So that database that worked so well for the Excel users also is something that they determined would scale well in the cloud uh, at a future date and that uh, it had a better uh, long-term future, I don't know all the exact technical reasons, than traditional OLAP cubes. Now, a few years later, those tabular models became a PaaS service in Azure called Azure Analysis Services. So the original tabular models were deployed inside of a SQL server, and they took that capability and made it a standalone platform as a service tool that you could deploy in Azure called Azure Analysis Services. Now at the bottom, you'll notice that I have labeled this the period of tribulations. The reason being is that there were effectively multiple different product lines that were all being integrated some of them made it, some of them didn't, but at the time it did seem like things kept changing and that the strategic direction wasn't always certain. Here's a slide for ProClarity Analytics showing how you bring data from the source into a SQL server where you can build your cube, then you have your ProClarity Analytics server, and from there you have different dashboards and reports. Another slide showing some of the advanced visualizations from ProClarity. In the upper left, you can see the decomp tree, which was brought back to Power BI in the late 2010s due to popular demand. And the right-hand side, there's a tree map, and you can see that uh, it also has the ability to change the color of the different segments and the size. So effectively, you have a couple different metrics in a single visual, and then also a scatter plot in the bottom left where there's different colors on the different markers along with your X and Y axis. Looks like there's some different shapes too. Now let's take a look at a performance point dashboard, which has a couple different components uh, that it's showing as PPS integration and uh, ProClarity views. Uh, I don't know how much of it is actually ProClarity, but it is uh, bringing in some ProClarity components, it looks like on the right. The scorecard on the left is showing a hierarchy on the rows and then a date hierarchy on the columns. Then in the upper right, you have a ProClarity scorecard with some different colors and a tree map in the bottom right. Next is the hamburger visual. So what's interesting here is you can see that there's a number of different sources down at the bottom, which SSIS, which is now specifically called out as SQL Server Integration Services, brings that data into SQL Server. You can then use either reporting services directly on SQL Server, or analysis services with an OLAP cube in order to uh, expose that data to the reporting layer. And then the bun on top of the hamburger is SharePoint where everything comes together under a single delivery platform. The next slide is taking a look at Excel and Power Pivot. And the story here was that your business analysts who are proficient in Excel can get additional scale by using Power Pivot, but still do their presentation inside of Excel, which is the tool that they know and love. Then they could migrate in order to share their report, migrate that content to SharePoint 2013 where other people could then view it and a refresh schedule could be set up so that from a self-service analytics perspective, everything was done in Excel, then it gets published to SharePoint and the underlying data in the Power Pivot model can be refreshed as if it were an enterprise grade solution. Here's a few more screenshots that I thought were interesting in the upper left is a performance point dashboard. And I can tell you this is performance point 2010 because that was the year they added pie charts, which you can see in the bottom right. Bottom left is another scorecard. And then on the right hand side, that's actually a power view report. Now power view looked and felt in some ways similar to how Power BI does today for building reports, uh, but it was a silver light tool that uh, eventually went extinct but it was uh, easy to use and designed to be something which was for more low-code, no-code uh, report development purposes. 
This next slide is looking at what they referred to as the BI semantic model. Note that that term has now come back around with Fabric and they are calling uh, both the Power BI and Fabric underlying tabular models, semantic models now in the service. But for this slide, we see many different sources coming into either a tabular model on the left-hand side, which could also be called Vertipak, or a multidimensional model or OLAP model uh, or cube, whatever you may call it on the right. And this was a time where both of these technologies coexisted and there were pros and cons to using either version. However, at the presentation level, most of the tools could effectively connect to either of them, depending on the particular use case. Long-term tabular models would win out, uh, but multidimensional models had quite a good run. You'll notice that this slide also breaks it down by areas where you can control access, where you control your, uh, what they're calling BI semantics, or the ability to uh, determine how the data translates to reports and what logic happens. And then you have your data model and application layer. Okay, moving back to the primary slide for this presentation, let's keep things moving forward. So now we enter the era of Power BI. Now Power BI, just like Fabric, wasn't something that came out of nowhere. A lot of these other components from Excel and Modern Work some acquisitions, and then also SQL Server and Azure all contributed to what we know and love as Power BI. Power Query, that low-code, no-code ETL tool from Excel became Power Query within Power BI. The tabular models that were built into SQL Server and Azure Analysis Services, those were then known as datasets within Power BI. So since I did this presentation, datasets have been renamed to semantic models, but whether you're talking about semantic models data sets, tabular models, the Vertipak engine, it's all the same thing. Next up was paginated reports, which is actually SQL Server reporting services. Uh, more specifically, it's very close to Report Builder, uh, which has its roots all the way back in SQL Server 2000. So if you were to look, the furthest back I can remember using Report Builder was around the mid 2000s and paginated Report Builder today looks very similar to the experience that I remember back in the day. Next came Data Flows, which was effectively a version of Power Query, which was independent of a uh, Power BI desktop file um, or a Power BI data set and could be run as an independent uh, ETL workload. Next came Data Marts, which was a version of Azure SQL Database under the hood or some flavor of SQL Database, I'm not exactly sure. This was uh, effectively uh, the next evolution of actually bringing a relational database uh, into Power BI. There's also a tool called Power BI Machine Learning, which is still available in Power BI today. I actually wrote a book about it if anybody wants to check it out, uh, but it effectively uses some of the capabilities of Azure ML and makes it uh, usable in Power BI is a very easy to use drag and drop uh, machine learning tool. Experienced data scientists probably wouldn't want to use something like Power BI ML, but if you're looking to learn the basics of machine learning, what it does and how to use it, it was a very useful tool to teach the concepts of what you can do with ML. Okay, so let's skip the Power BI slide since most of you have probably already seen those in recent years. And let's move on to Azure PaaS, which is Platform as a Service, and Synapse. So in parallel to the convergences that we saw with Power BI, there was another project called Azure Synapse, which still exists and is used by many customers today. So Azure Synapse united a couple different capabilities from Azure. So earlier we talked about Azure SQL Data Warehouse, which went back to the APS, which was the parallel data warehouse, which went back to the SQL Server lineage. And uh, within Azure Synapse, that then evolved to what was called dedicated SQL pools. Additionally, Apache Spark was used to design Spark notebooks within Azure Synapse. And Spark notebooks are very popular with data engineers and data scientists and people who like to write high code ETL and uh, data science machine learning type workloads. Then the data lake was also part of Azure Synapse referred to as the lake database. And within Azure Data Factory, there was a capability called pipelines that were brought into Synapse that are excellent for data orchestration. So Data Factory was somewhat parallel to SQL Server integration services, but completely two different products. And the pipelines capability within Azure Data Factory was brought into Synapse. 
And also Azure Data Explorer, which uses Custo query language, was brought into Synapse for some KQL uh, capabilities. Also added to Synapse were serverless SQL pools. Uh, serverless SQL pools allow you to connect to data uh, that is not in a relational database as if it were a relational database. So you can write SQL queries against the endpoint, and on the back end, the queries actually get run against data that could be sitting in something such as an Azure Data Lake. Now, let's move to the next step, which is what I'm referring to as the cloud singularity. Again, I'm trying to keep things fun and interesting here. Hopefully it comes across that way. Now with the cloud singularity, I wanna stress that the Azure PaaS capabilities will still exist within Azure. They're not going anywhere. So you look back to 2012 when you had both tabular and OLAP cubes uh, available within analysis services. And a lot of Microsoft customers would ask, are OLAP cubes going away? Are we going to be forced to migrate to tabular models? Uh, the answer was no. Uh, and you can still use OLAP cubes today if you deploy a SQL Server. There's nothing new in them. They're basically the same as they were several years ago, but they're still available. And the same thing is true with uh, a lot of the Azure services, although I will say most of those probably will continue to change and evolve and get better over time, uh, but they're not going anywhere. It's just the PaaS or platform as a service uh, version of the tools. Whereas uh, Power BI is the SaaS or the software as a service uh, version of the tools. Now, this is where we enter the era of fabric or what I'm referring to as the cloud singularity, which is where everything starts to converge under a single umbrella in order to simplify how things get managed, how things get built, and make it easier for everything to just work together. So first of all, the data visualization capabilities in Power BI are there in fabric. The Power Query capabilities from Power BI, they're there in Fabric. Datasets from Power BI are now called semantic models in Fabric. I haven't updated this slide. Paginated reports, still there in Fabric. Data flows and Data Flows Gen 2 are available in Fabric. Eventually, I would expect it to just be Data Flows Gen 2, or maybe they'll change the name to just Data Flows. But effectively, uh, with Gen 2, you get the ability to write to a different destination, such as an Azure SQL database. So you have a low-code, no-code ETL tool uh, within Fabric that uh, business users uh, can leverage. Data Marts are still there in Fabric. Power BI ML did not make the cut to Fabric. Instead, there's some other capabilities uh, coming to Fabric. There will be Fabric machine learning tools. There's ML Ops integration. As I'll show in a little bit, the notebooks are available in Fabric from Synapse. Uh, so there's other options there. Power BI machine learning is uh, one of those tools that just, you know, long-term isn't going to be there in Fabric. It is still there right now if you're using it, and I, I'm sure it'll be there for some time to come. And as I mentioned, the Spark notebooks from Azure Synapse are part of the uh, machine learning tools that are now in Fabric. And you can also use Spark notebooks for other things, such as ETL workloads. You can use Python, R, some different capabilities to, to spin up those Spark nodes and run some extremely large volumes of data through ETL, ELT, and machine learning workloads within the Fabric ecosystem. The serverless endpoints from Synapse are also available in Fabric. So when you connect to a Fabric lake house or warehouse, you can connect to it as if it were a SQL database, even though on the back end, it's really not a SQL database. It's a lake house architecture. The lake house has its roots in Azure Data Lake. And effectively what Fabric does is it just puts a software layer on top of Azure Data Lake and calls it one lake which makes it much easier to use and available to users who maybe you don't want working inside of an Azure subscription. Next, the pipelines, which come from Azure Data Factory, are available in Fabric for data orchestration and uh, many other types of tasks that you traditionally would have done with ADF. There are real-time capabilities within Fabric, uh, such as connecting to either an event hub or using the Custo query language with the Custo database. And then in late 2022, all of a sudden, everything got shook up with the arrival of OpenAI. I can remember the first time I saw ChatGPT. I believe it was either late November or December of 2022. And at first, I thought somebody was playing a trick on me. I didn't think it was real. Uh, but uh, now it's become just another piece of technology that we have available to us. 
uh, one that I think is going to uh, change the world as we know it, uh, but that at this point is now another piece of technology that we want to integrate with other things in our ecosystems. And OpenAI, through its Microsoft partnership, led to Azure OpenAI so that customers can use those OpenAI models within their Azure subscriptions and within their Azure tenants in a way that is secure and controlled and governed. And within Fabric, you can also leverage the large language models of OpenAI using the co-pilots. Uh, again, when I wrote this slide, co-pilot was singular. It's now, there are now three different co-pilots within Fabric. There's the Power BI co-pilot, there's the Azure Data Factory co-pilot for things like data transformations and joins, the types of work that people traditionally would have done using the SQL language. And then there's also the Data Science co-pilot, which works with the Spark notebooks. Additionally, Microsoft has a tool called Purview for data governance and data lineage, those types of activities. And Purview is also available through Fabric where you can effectively have an interface to Purview from your Fabric workspace in order to tie everything together for administration and governance purposes. Now, the data warehouse capability within Fabric is slightly different than what you had with Azure Synapse, uh, but there's effectively a data warehouse that looks and feels like SQL. You can even connect to it using SQL Server Management Studio and run SQL queries. To the end user, you'd think you were using a SQL database, but on the back end, it's using that same common lake house architecture that unites everything in Fabric. Within Fabric, there's also the concepts of One Lake and Data Hub. Uh, One Lake being the uh, software as a service interface on top of Azure Data Lake or the Lake House, and Data Hub being a marketplace for your enterprise users to go find the data that they have access to. And finally, Reflex within Fabric is a new capability which will allow you to have data-driven alerts, data-driven actions, uh, triggers and integration with Power Platform, that sort of thing. A couple of years ago, I worked with a coworker to put a Git repo together that was looking at five years of data using Azure tools along with Power BI. I believe we started this in 2019, if I'm not mistaken. Might have been 2020. But effectively, to do something like this, you would have to use Azure Data Factory to extract and load data. You would have to use Azure Data Lake. You would have potentially networking components. You would have Azure Synapse in order to host the dedicated pools. And then you'd also have Power BI. And all of these different components would spin up different bills. In, and so estimating the cost of a solution could be a chore unto itself or a project unto itself. Now with Fabric, you can effectively have the same type of solution all under the umbrella of a single licensing model in a single suite of products. So some of these products are the same as they were before. However, it's much easier to implement, much easier to estimate, and a lot less time is spent on networking and integration. And we actually rebuilt that exact same repo throughout the course of the last year, and we've also improved upon it with some additional modules. And the speed at which you can design, develop, and deploy solutions is orders of magnitude faster when you have it all available in a single workspace. All right, so that's the end of the presentation. If you liked this video, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. I'll try to have more similar content available in the future. Comments, questions are more than welcome uh, in the comment section of this video. And I've also created bookmarks uh, within this video so you can rewind to specific portions. If you just want to look at the SQL lineage or maybe the modern work, uh, you should be able to, to jump to those points in the video using, using the bookmarks uh, when you scroll at the bottom of the video. And if you've watched the whole video and made it this far, thank you for watching.